to another Centennial Tidbit, where today we're talking with Luke Clausen of the Independent Seaport Museum and a member of the USS Olympia Living History Crew. And I've had a chance to talk to Luke a lot before this interview and have a ton of questions, but we're going to try and keep it focused uh, to some very specific areas of the ship. And, and I'd first like to ask you, Luke, can you just give us a brief history about the USS Olympia? Absolutely. Cruiser Olympia is America's oldest steel warship that's still afloat. She had a, quite a service history, was commissioned in 1895 to be a flagship in the Asiatic Squadron. So she was uh, built at the Union Iron Works in San Francisco, California, immediately went to Japan, China, had the distinction of being Admiral Dewey's flagship at the Battle of Manila Bay. So this was the lead off action of the Spanish-American War. And uh, that was her main claim to fame. She stayed in the Philippines for occupation duty, then sailed around the world back to New York, received Theodore Roosevelt in New York Harbor, uh, ended up uh, going into a major refit and becoming uh, quite an important ship in the Atlantic. So she served as, uh, at various points, a flagship. She served on uh, squadron duty in the Atlantic and the, uh, in the Caribbean, as well as taking uh, sailors and uh, officer cadets from the U.S. Naval Academy on their training cruises in the summer. She also did a lot of peacekeeping work in Central and South America. During World War I, she started off on convoy duty, but ended up taking a, a group of sailors to Murmansk, Russia, as part of the uh, Allied intervention in Russia after the Russians left the World War I. So uh, Olympia sailors actually spent the summer and fall of 1918 fighting as infantry against Red Russians around Archangel Russia. So after that, she ended up in the Adriatic doing peacekeeping duty. And importantly for us, she brought home the unknown soldier from World War I. That was her last major duty before being decommissioned in 1922. From that point, she was in the Philadelphia Navy Yard until the uh, Cruiser Olympia Association ended up doing a restoration process in the mid 50s. And then she ended up with the Independent Seaport Museum and is now a museum ship in Philadelphia. Outstanding. I didn't know uh, all of that history. I knew, I knew some of the highlights, but uh, that, that part about Russia is very interesting. And maybe, maybe we'll have to dive into that a little bit later on. Um, you're part of the Living History Crew. Can you, can you tell us a little bit of detail about what the crew does and why it's so important? Sure. The Cruiser Olympia Living History Crew tries to portray the life of the average sailor and Marine during Olympia's service life. So that's between 1895 and 1922. So we set up aboard the ship, wear period uniforms, use period equipment, live aboard the ship for a couple of days and try to give visitors an experience where whenever they come aboard, they can see the ship inhabited. So they'll see us cooking in the galley or doing maintenance on the ship's guns or doing things that you would have seen sailors and Marines do aboard a ship like that during your service life. We also take the, uh, the, the, sh the show on the road, as it were, and do uh, programming at places like Eisenhower Farm National Historic, or the Eisenhower National Historic Site in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, also local uh, state parks like Fort Mott State Park in New Jersey, uh, talking about things like the Navy Infantry Landing Force or Navy logistics during World War One, you know, things like that. That way we can, we don't just have to be on the ship all the time. We can go out and do outreach work away from the ship. So this month, uh, the Olympia and many other organizations participated in the National Salute, and you tied in with the Ford Chaplains Memorial Foundation there in Philadelphia to create a great video <clears throat> of the ringing and that culminated with the ringing of the ship's bells 21 times. And part of our program with the National Salute talks about if organization has the ability to fire guns or cannon, it really got me thinking about the USS Olympia and the guns that she has aboard. Can you describe or tell us a little bit about what type of armament that the Olympia carries? Sure. Cruiser Olympia started off with quite a, uh, an array of armaments. She had two turrets fore and aft uh, that carried each two eight-inch guns. She also had a main battery of 10 five-inch guns and then a secondary battery of 14 uh, three-inch six-pound guns, also two Gatling guns, as well as uh, four one-pound guns that were up in her main tops. And then also she had uh, four uh, or six rather torpedo tubes as initially designed, that the uh, ships of the 1890s had all sorts of, uh, of a crazy armament aboard. 
So by World War I, they had taken out the torpedo tubes, a lot of the secondary armaments. So she had, at that point, 10 five-inch guns. They removed the fore and aft turrets because of, of how inefficient they were and replaced them with five-inch deck guns. And then she had four of the uh, six-pound guns that were mainly used for saluting. And uh, again, the torpedo tubes were gone. A lot of the secondary armament was gone. I noticed that in the history, when the Olympia left France uh, and, and was starting her difficult journey home with the U.S. or with the unknown soldier, um, the video or the film at the time shows that the French Navy was firing salutes as she left port. How did the Olympia respond to this? So Olympia, as prescribed by U.S. Navy regulations, so this is the U.S. Navy regulations from 1921. You can see what a boat anchor of a book it is. There is an entire chapter which prescribes how salutes should be rendered and returned. So what was typical for foreign navies is to fire a 21 gun salute in return to their salute. And it all depends upon the size of the ship, the people aboard. So if you've got a signal gun, you can fire that 21 times even to the, if, if you have a small ship like a tug with no armament, you can ring the ship's bell 21 times. So either the bell or the ship's guns are considered an appropriate salute to return or to give or to return a salute. So, and forgive me because I'm an infantryman and I just don't understand some of this stuff, but um, would the vessel at the time in, in, in 1921 carry uh, blank rounds, or are these live rounds that are being fired as a salute? So U.S. Navy ships always carried a complement of blank rounds specifically for saluting. That saluting in the U.S. Navy goes back to the very beginning of the U.S. Navy, and that follows all the way back through like British Royal Navy traditions to have a, a certain amount of ceremonial rounds, as it were, put away in your magazine. And that way, if you need to render honors, you can do so. So uh, a ship like Olympia would have carried a complement of blank rounds specifically for saluting. Okay, well that makes a little more sense. Can you can you go into some detail about these six pound guns that she has aboard? The six pound guns are pretty unique to the ship. The ones that are aboard Olympia now are not her original six pound guns, but they are guns from the 1890s. So they date to uh, Olympia's service life that whenever they were first put aboard the ship, five inch guns couldn't move back and forth quickly enough or depress enough to be able to shoot at small boats like torpedo boats. So guns like that were a pretty important part of the armament. They were below the gun deck. So if you look at Olympia from the side, there's like a row of portholes and then there's her superstructure where there's guns and battery and then there's a deck on top of that. So with these six pound guns, they would be around that row of portholes right around the side of the ship that's on the berth deck. So this is where sailors sleep mostly. And then they're also on top of the superstructure deck. And that way they're close to the water. That way, if they need to track smaller ships, they can. And they're a little higher up. That way they can get a, a better view on things. By World War I, those guns were, uh, were, were not terribly efficient. They had been outdated by that point that you could move the five inch guns quickly enough to track faster vessels. So the Navy mainly kept them as saluting guns. That way you don't have to use a five inch gun or part of your main battery to give a salute, you can use a smaller gun specifically for that purpose. Where did uh, Olympia's uh, deck or six pounders go? So whenever they, they during various refits, the Navy took them off and would put them in reserve uh, somewhere in a, in a Navy yard that uh, the Navy was just pretty good about not letting equipment go to waste. So any kind of guns that were taken off of ships, everything like anchors, equipment of all sorts, they store it at a Navy yard and if it can be reused on another ship, they do it and then the Navy still does that. So with Olympia's original guns when they were taken off, they were taken to an ordnance yard somewhere and kept in reserve until they were either decommissioned, destroyed or, or given over to museums, whatever. So the uh, guns that are aboard Olympia today are ones that got cycled back out through the US Navy to uh, be put on ships like Olympia. So for example, Olympia's five inch guns were actually aboard the battleship Colorado. And uh, if you uh, look at the front of them, they're stamped USS Colorado. So they're not the original five inch guns that were aboard Olympia during World War I, but they're the exact type that were there during World War I. Well, that's pretty cool. That's interesting, thank you. Um, you know, uh, how many crewmen does it take to, to fire off um, a six pounder? And you know, can you tell me what their duties are? It takes four people to fire a six pound gun. 
that you've uh, got your gun commander. So this is the person that aims the gun. They're in charge of firing the gun. You have uh, what's called a, a plug man or a breech man. He stands to the side and operates the breech handle. So he rotates the thing, opens up the back end of the gun. That way you can put in the round. Then you've got um, a man specifically to load the round into the gun. And then you've got a shell passer. So this is somebody who's standing back with a box of ammunition. They break it open. They get the shells ready whenever the shell man puts the shell into the gun. He turns around, grabs one from the shell passer. And then you have a whole line of people that go from the gun to like a deck hatch or a passing room, which is where you pass ammunition back and forth. So you have a whole line of people on deck that are moving ammunition. But just directly involved with the gun, you need four people. Okay. And and what did uh, a well-trained crew, how, how fast could they fire that six-pounder? So with a six pounder, uh, like on Olympia, you can fire those things up to 10 times in a minute. It's really quick that with the uh, sighting system that's on it, it's uh, it's like open sights. It's like looking on a 1903 Springfield, the, the way the sights are set up. So as quickly as you can move the gun and pull the trigger, it goes really fast. Wow. Very cool. And I know that you've uh, you've done it yourself a couple of times. What's it like to fire that? It's pretty incredible. It's It's neat to know that we... I have taken the time to learn the period drill. Whenever we uh, set up around the gun, the living history crew, we, we do it in this period of correct a way as we can. But uh, knowing that we're firing a gun that was built in 1890 is, is, is pretty fun for us. We also do the maintenance on the gun as well. So whenever we're finished firing it, we take it apart. We take it completely apart, the breech block, everything, clean it and put it back together because we realize that it is an historic artifact and uh, we don't, uh, we don't take for granted the privilege we have of getting to shoot an artifact like that. Not too many people get to say they get to fire off a cannon that was uh, created in the late 1800s. That's pretty impressive. Um, you know, one of the other things when I was looking through the logbooks for Olympia's difficult journey home with the unknown soldier, I noted that when she'd passed Mount Vernon, the log simply stated that she rendered honors and didn't say firing deck cannon like they did returning a salute for salute in France. Can you tell me more what this uh, rendering honors may entail passing Mount Vernon? So traditionally, the, the Navy fired a gun salute whenever they passed Mount Vernon. And that uh, the earliest recorded incidence of that is in 1801, whenever uh, three frigates passing by Mount Vernon stopped to render honors by firing the ship's guns as they passed. There wasn't actually a prescribed method for rendering honors at Mount Vernon until President Theodore Roosevelt's administration. That uh, he, whenever he was making a pass with the uh, presidential yacht Mayflower, uh, the Mayflower rendered a salute and he thought that it was pretty impressive. And so he gave a presidential order number 22, which was June 2nd, 1906, that uh, whenever U.S. Navy ships passed, that the Marine and the band, the Marine Guard and the band would parade. All men on the ship who weren't on watch would come on deck and give a salute. The uh, flag would be pulled down to half mast wherever it was being flown, and that the ship's bell would toll eight times with a five second interval in between tolling. And then in 1913, it got added up that uh, the ship would play the national anthem as it passed by. So that was the the official U.S. Navy rendering honors whenever they went by Mount Vernon. Ships could also fire a salute if they chose to, that that was a, another part of this as well. Wow, that's interesting. I've, I've, I've always heard that they would do that, but not in that great detail. Thank you for that, I appreciate that. Um, can you tell me uh, how the public can find out more about the USS Olympia, your, your living history crew, and, and what the Independent Seaport Museum is trying to do by getting the Olympia into dry dock? So you can find out all sorts of fantastic information about Cruiser Olympia in the Independent Seaport Museum with our website, which is phillyseaport.org. We also have a pretty strong presence on social media. So we have the Independent Seaport Museum page. We also have the Cruiser Olympia at Independent Seaport Museum page and then the Cruiser Olympia Living History Crew. So we do a lot of cross posting, everything that happens in one, everybody else posts out about it. So uh, any kind of maintenance work that's done on the ship, the living history cruise activities, uh, everything that we're going to be doing in 2021 during the uh, unknown soldier centennial, you know, you'll be able to find out about it there. Cruiser Olympia 
is a, a pretty important ship, and, and we're trying to let everybody who will listen know that she is, is quite an important ship for the American Navy and uh, that she does need a lot of work, that uh, her hull needs repair, she needs to go to the dry dock, her decks need a lot of work, you know, that she, she does need a lot of work. She's not in danger of sinking where she sits, but she needs to get in the dry dock sooner rather than later. So we are trying to build awareness on the, or in the midst of the fundraising campaign to get her in the dry dock, that way we can get necessary hull repairs done, to figure out uh, decking solutions, that way we can take up what's there because a lot of the deck that's there is uh, what was put on in the last refit in 1918. So it's uh, been there over a hundred years. Uh, so we're, we're looking to, to get creative solutions to that, uh, realizing that whenever a ship like Olympia was in service, she had 450 men to do constant careful maintenance and uh, the coffers of US Congress and the Navy Department behind uh, doing that work. But now we're, we're kind of on our own to figure it out. We can write for grants, but we do ask that if uh, people are interested in the project to check us out, see what we're doing and to please uh, throw some money our way. That way we can help keep the ship afloat and keep her open for visitors for a long time to come. Well, I, you guys are doing some amazing work. Uh, I was lucky enough last year to visit the ship. Uh, incredibly impressed. Um, one is one of those things where I, I felt uh, uh, again, being an infantryman and, uh, and thinking that ships were watertight, uh, especially of that era, finding out not so much uh, water troughs were built into certain decks that allow the water to flow freely. Um, I think that what you're doing there is, is incredibly important. I think people need to go to Philadelphia and visit the Independent Seaport Museum uh, and step aboard the Olympia, interact with the Living History crew and, and truly understand what this ship did for our nation as well as our unknown soldier so <clears throat> i congratulate you on everything you're doing and i have a feeling that you and i are going to be talking more about the ship as the months come along absolutely look forward to it okay well thanks for taking the time today luke and we'll, we'll talk to you next time absolutely thank you